just quickly, can you tell us what, what cancer did you have and, and why did you go for proton therapy and go all the way to Czechoslovakia? So I've got a grade three papillary meningioma at the base of my spine. So it sits over my sacrum. Um, and that's a tumor that comes from the lining of the nerve and nerves in the spinal cord. So the position of that tumor um, meant that if I had regular radiation, um, the radiation would penetrate also my uterus, ovaries, and the organs around. So essentially proton therapy allowed uh, me to get radiation without putting the other organs at risk around it. So in that sense, proton therapy was just to stop the growth of the tumour, which it has done, but I still have the tumour at the base of my spine there. Uh, so, so the sacrum is at the base of your spine? It's that heart-shaped one at the very bottom, yeah. You uh, are using a wheelchair as I speak to you now. Are you able to walk? Yeah, so when I first had proton treatment, it flared up um, my pain and I had quite significant decline in my mobility. Um, so I, I was using two crutches to hobble. But uh, since then I've been doing physiotherapy, rehab. Um, so now I have to sit in a wheelchair for pain reasons and fatigue reasons more than anything. But I walk with um, a single walking stick now. So I've definitely improved in the last couple of years. I'm very, very pleased to hear that, needless to say. <laughs> now I know you're a passionate advocate as I am. And this whole series is about how to improve the radiation experience for patients and families. And of course, proton therapy is a kind of radiation that's soon coming to Australia. One of the things you're keen about is having agency and control during treatment. What do those words mean, agency and control? When we think about the cancer experience, you have to think about um, how that can make you feel like your whole life is out of control, basically. you know. Treatment can affect your hair, it can affect your weight, perhaps you have to stop studying or working. Um, and so you get a risk of losing the things that define your identity. So if we can give patients um, choices, that lets them express themselves um, and they can feel a little bit of control in very small ways. Um, and that has a really big impact in the long term. Can you give us some some examples of the sort of things people can do at the new Proton Therapy Centre in Australia when it opens or anywhere dealing with radiation that can give particularly younger patients a sense of agency and control. So as you say, teenagers and young adults are especially vulnerable to that feeling that they're losing control because um, they're just starting to learn who they are and then that's at risk of being taken away from them even if it's just temporarily. So something like having a diary, being given a diary, printouts of your month or your year calendar of appointments can make you feel um, that you know what's coming and what's expected of you. And that seems like such a small thing, but it can change how you plan your week and your month and just how you feel about that. Are there um, digital versions of diaries like that? Because uh, as having been a patient myself, it can change so rapidly from week to week or even day to day, can't it? Who you need to see or what test or more blood tests or whatever. Yeah, that's true. I actually found, um, I'm sure you understand that in cancer treatment, often you have brain fog, things like focusing on small devices and small texts can be quite hard for some patients. So I found hard copy versions preferable myself. I found things like putting up on a whiteboard even just a layout of the week and then doctors and nurses can uh, adjust what your appointments are quite easily that way, but it digitally would work as well. Just something that you can check and see, um, especially if it's, you know, visual representation can be really helpful. And where did you have the whiteboard? Um, that was in, uh, when I had treatment in the Royal Adelaide Hospital just down the road, um, I had that in my room there with a whiteboard of appointments. So I found that very helpful. Another issue I think you have strong feelings about is the importance of engaging with young patients about clinical decision making. Tell us more about that. I think it's quite easy to get, um, with, especially with young patients, for the uh, providers to accidentally start addressing the parents and you sort of end up talking over the patient's head a little. But providers really need to remember that, especially with young adults, the patient is the one that you're addressing first and foremost. Um, so yeah, I think young people, you want to be, letting them know and having that eye contact and that 
personal contact to say that they are the ones in control and they're the ones being addressed here. How old were you when you were having your treatment? I was 23, so this is a couple of years ago, yeah. I mean, you'd expect at that age that you would get eye contact, but you clearly feel that's something that we need to remind our clinical teams about. Yeah, it's it's difficult, especially when you have, we've got, most people have blended families nowadays. You can end up with quite a few people in the room to help support you there. And it can be kind of like you're addressing a crowd as a practitioner, I feel. Um, and you do want to make sure that everybody feels involved. That's important for the support people as well. Um, as I think with young adults, it's easy to fall back on the things that are comfortable and you trust your parents and you trust that they'll represent your needs. So it, you kind of fall back into um, childhood patterns, I think, as a young adult cancer patient. Look, let's turn to uh, being prepared for the actual proton therapy, uh, the actual treatment. When you were treated in Prague in the Czech Republic, they had tours of the treatment centre, including the bunkers. Can you explain what the bunker are and the treatment centres and why you think those tours are an idea worthy of being taken up in Australia? Sure. So um, in Prague, my parents went on a tour after the working day. Um, the facility I was treated at was an outpatient centre, so they didn't treat people in the evenings. Um, and it was an opportunity for them to ask questions of someone who isn't a busy working doctor and actually see it because uh, I was going to the bunker each day by myself. My parents never went in, so they didn't actually know what it looked like until they went on these tours. Um, the bunkers in the Prague Centre were sort of a few doors in. They were separate from the main reception areas. So it's quite um, a cavernous experience to go down into the depths of a building and then spend this time in a bunker getting treated. Um, it feels quite closed off. And why do you think it's important that parents and family get to see the bunker? Uh, how does it help you as a patient? Well, I think it's important for the parents and support people to have a chance to ask questions, to actually understand the treatment that you're getting. Um, and this is really important because uh, it allows them to feel like they're involved. Um, and cancer treatment is such an alienating, alienating experience as a patient that you really want people around you who understand. Um, and I find in any situation, it's the unknown and the uncertainty that's the scariest thing. So if we can just expose people to the information, then that demystifies the whole process for everybody. You'd like to see those tours made available to the general public and certainly to members of multidisciplinary cancer teams within the Australian Proton Therapy Centre. Why do you say that? I think um, we've got a real opportunity here in Adelaide to be a hub for medical research. So I think outreach, not just to the public, but say to medical students to encourage them to pursue this field um, would be a fantastic opportunity. And like you say, multidisciplinary providers can see the process and what actually happens and better understand how they can provide for their patients in their own areas if they understand the whole experience better. Let's deal with that multidisciplinary issue now, if I may, because uh, it's well known that the best treatment is provided, whether it's conventional radiation therapy or proton therapy, in a multidisciplinary team environment with the highest possible volume of patients. So everybody gets the experience and expertise. Can you explain why you think that team and having good numbers of staff team members, including allied health nurses, as well as the radiation therapists, and the uh, various kinds of doctors is absolutely critical to the patient experience. Why is it important to have the team and the allied health? Well, I think it's important to remember that the cancer experience goes beyond your first diagnosis and it goes beyond your treatment, especially in my case, um, cancer diagnosis has come along with chronic health conditions and disability. So I think if you start from the beginning with a multidisciplinary team, then that can get you engaged in services that you're going to continue to access beyond treatment. Um, and you have to remember the cancer experience is more than just surgery and radiation. It's psychological treatment, it's pain management, um, and it's the rehab afterwards. You particularly benefited from physiotherapy and a rather 
remarkable piece of technology and we've got some film of that we can show while you're explaining it. So why did you need physiotherapy and what were you offered at the Women and Children's Hospital in Adelaide that was just so beneficial? Physiotherapy for me uh, was the difference in quality of life for me. So I was lucky enough through the Youth Cancer Service to have access to an exercise physiologist before I went to treatment. So we did a kind of pre treatment rehab or prehab to get me as strong as possible before I went, um, which was for the best because while I was in treatment, I was bedridden. I had really severe pain um, and severe mobility issues. So I really needed to get as strong as possible. And that had benefits for my fatigue, for my psychological well-being, And it gave me that sense of control that I thought I was being proactive about my treatment. So one of the things I I had access to was the locomat. So the locomat is a piece of uh, robotic medical equipment that can teach you essentially how to walk correctly. So it takes pressure off your legs, it can lift you, so that way you can develop uh, strength again gradually. And the robotic legs sort of force your legs through a correct pace and a correct gait. So that allowed me to stretch my nerves and my muscle after treatment. Um, and I went from, as I said, hobbling on two sticks to able to walk confidently again. Um, and that made a huge difference. Um, and that was not available to the public. That was only through a study, as you say, at the Women's and Children's Hospital. So it'd be fantastic if people could have more access to uh, things like that. Tell us about your other concerns about things like transport from accommodation to treatment and then the capacity of someone using a wheelchair or with mobility issues to actually get to all the different places you need to get during and after treatment. Disability accessibility is more than just being able to enter a building. It's um, how easy that entrance is and how that makes you feel. So accessibility is so much more than just the actual infrastructure. Um, but for me, as I said, I had quite severe pain and mobility issues during my treatment. So the way that I was transported from my hotel room to my uh, to the treatment at the outpatient centre was by lying face down on a hospital gurney in a an ambulance. So there's no um, non-emergency service available to the public in South Australia for um, tra transport of patients like that who are very vulnerable. Um, and so my concern is that we want to have patients not left waiting any longer than they have to and to minimise how much distress and pain they're in to have that process of transport be as efficient as possible. Um, that was a ma major factor in my own treatment. Look, let's come to um, some other particular needs of young people, uh, teenagers, school children, young adults. A and you, you raise issues around having the capacity to manage your school or university or TAFE or other studies or work during prolonged treatment, but also the need for privacy and for separation of age groups. Tell us about these particular needs and what you want to see. Yeah, so when I was diagnosed, it was actually the first week of my, what I thought was the last year of my undergraduate degree. So I was trying to get in as much study as I could while attending a lot of appointments and spending a lot of time waiting in crowded, quite noisy waiting rooms. So I can't underemphasize how important it is for young people to have access to a quiet study space. Um, and one thing that uh, has done, been done very well is the Sony UCAN Foundation has provided spaces in hospitals across Australia for youths and young adult patients to um, have a space that's not their hospital room to go to. So this is a quiet study space where they have computers, internet access, but they also have kitchen facilities and more social spaces with couches, TVs, um, PlayStations, where they can meet their friends and feel like they have that continuity with their outside life. Um, so those spaces are invaluable, especially to young adult patients. There needs to be rooms where people can retreat and be alone and also separate from other waiting patients. Why are they important? Right, so I think a welcoming and open uh, waiting room space is really important, but you do need the alternative um, for patients such as in my situation where I was on a hospital bed. 
uh, face down, very vulnerable and feeling very self-conscious. So in Prague, I had access to a small quiet room where I could wait with my parents before my treatment in the bunker. Um, and that allowed us to have the lights dimmed, the noise very quiet, so that I was less distressed. And I think the same could be provided for underage children who ideally um, the parents and their doctors are would be, have a private space to deal with things that can be really distressing with younger patients in proton therapy. So for some patients, they have to be sedated in order to lie still. Um, and they really need somewhere that they feel safe and secure to recover from that sedation each time. Um, the other thing that would be useful would be perhaps uh, organizing appointments around similar age groups. So that alienation that a teenager might feel, that awkwardness sitting next to a four-year-old patient is sort of avoided. In Prague, they had a patient coordination team, uh, which I gather had a lot of former cancer patients in it. What did you see in Prague that was good and what do you want to see in Australia? Right, so I was travelling overseas and if we have patients travelling here, which I assume we will as the first uh, proton therapy centre in the Southern Hemisphere, um, that you're dealing with a lot of things that need coordination. There's accommodation, there's things like transport, as we spoke about, and um, even internet, phone plans, food, all of those things need coordination. So the team in Prague were amazing with helping us. They checked in on us daily and made sure that we were ready for my treatment each day. And that allowed their um, therapy to happen on time with minimal delays. Um, I think if we can provide that coordination, everything just runs a little smoother. Can I ask you, uh, and we're going to ask everybody we interview for this series, what is proton therapy? If you were explaining it to another woman in her, or another young person in their early 20s, and they said, what is proton therapy? What, what would you say? I'm not excellent on the science of it. I'll admit I'm a humanities student. Um, as far as explaining it to some, another patient, I would say you, it's less invasive than surgery. It's quite serious. You go into a machine, um, you have a high dose of radiation, which I refer to as my intense sunburn on my back. Um, and then that way a rep proton can penetrate and it stops at the point that we need it to. It doesn't go all the way through. So that's the difference between that and regular radiation. But it's just, I liken it to, uh, a sort of a journey to the underworld that you go into the depths of this bunker you have a strange magical experience and you come out the other side so that's my explanation of it that is fantastic uh, i too was a humanities uh, student and i did latin and ancient history and it truly is a journey to the underworld uh, and we emerge and that's the great part it's it's been an absolute joy to talk to you shona thank you so much no worries lovely to talk to you